Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Texas is now on the clock when it comes to its trigger law that would ban abortions completely. That law has been on the books for when and if the Supreme Court issued a ruling overturning Roe versus Wade. That final judgment was issued by the U.S. Supreme Court today. That final judgment makes the Supreme Court's opinion a few weeks ago official. Nothing really happens after the opinion is released. There are procedural and administrative steps that need to happen before the decision takes hold. That has now happened. The Texas trigger law supposed to ban abortion within 30 days after the court's ruling. New at six, a critical shortage. That is once again the way local health officials are describing our current blood supply. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center hosting two more blood drives this week to address the situation. RJ Marquez stopped by one of those blood drives to speak to officials about the need, the desperate need for blood in South Texas. It's a dire emergency that we need that blood to be available and on hand and ready to be issued out to our patients. Willie Williams is a surgical nurse at Krista Santa Rosa Medical Center and has seen firsthand the need for blood donations in our community. It impacts us the most is when we have those unplanned surgeries that do require a blood transfusion. Roger Ruiz with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says levels have not been this low across the region for months. We are seeing levels where it's less than three days, sometimes less than a day of our blood supply. Blood donations are also down this summer. Right now we're averaging probably about three to 350 donations a day. We ideally like to collect 600 units a day. The Blood and Tissue Center serves 48 counties and over 100 hospitals and clinics. They're hosting blood drives Wednesday and Friday to combat the shortage. And Roger Ruiz says that the typo blood supply, which is one of the most critical, is needed the most because it is at a one day supply. And keep in mind that one of these blood donations can save three lives. O negative is the, is the red blood so that can be transfused to anybody in an emergency. Many cancer patients and people with blood disorders also depend on these donations for treatment. Ruiz and Williams say any type of blood donation is needed at the moment. It's a completely safe process. I'm a blood donor. I've been donating for years whenever um, I'm able to donate. Um, it's a great thing to do. If we stop collecting blood today, we would only have enough for just one day for 24 hours, which is pretty scary. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Happening right now, the Uvalde City Council is meeting and a big item on their agenda today is asking Governor Greg Abbott to call a special legislative session to consider raising the minimum age to purchase semi-automatic assault rifles. Lee Waldman in Uvalde, where some families say that that does not go far enough. Since the shooting on May 24th, families of Robb Elementary victims have become advocates for gun law changes, some even calling for assault weapons bans. Lexi Rubio's parents first took up the call in front of a U.S. House committee hearing in June. It was echoed by other families in D.C. at a march in July. After yesterday's school board meeting, we spoke with Uzziah's guardian, Brett Cross, who said there is no reason for anyone to be able to legally purchase a gun like the one used to kill 21 people inside of Robb Elementary. I want to say something too that everybody understands. Y'all see pictures of them smiling and happy and everything. That is not how they died. They were slaughtered. It was a massacre. Do y'all know what a 10 year old casket looks like? Because it's not a pretty sight. These weapons need to go. When asked at the last city council meeting whether or not he would support raising the age to buy an assault style rifle, Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin said absolutely. We'll bring you the latest from tonight's meeting on Nightbeat. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. It's two people behind bars tonight for the murder of a man outside of a northeast side hookah lounge. 22 year old Nathan Sanchez, 20 year old Aaron Trevino being charged with the capital murder of 20 year old Takai Michael. San Antonio police say Michael was killed outside the Blow Hookah Lounge on Eisenhower Road in May. According to SAPD, Sanchez and Trevino traveled to Kansas following that shooting to stay with relatives and out of the sight of police. Police say the relatives actually identified them as the suspects in the shooting. Trevino arrested in Kansas. He will be extradited back here. Sanchez was arrested in San Antonio. It's been more than a year and a half, but police in Holotus are no closer to catching the driver that they say killed 36 year old Jerry Sanchez. Sanchez just walking alongside Highway 16 when he was hit and killed in December of 2020. According to investigators, they believe a truck hit him and never stopped. 
Police believe the suspect vehicle is a black Ram 25 or 3500 with yellow clearance lights and Mopar brand headlights. Information that leads to an arrest could be worth a cash reward from Crime Stoppers. You can call 210-224-STOP. Testimony getting underway today in the trial of a man accused of trafficking a teenage girl. 19-year-old Xavier Green was arrested in 2020, charged with trafficking a person under 18. The alleged victim in this case, who was 16 at the time, testified that when she met Green and his friend, it was online. When she ran away from home, they picked her up. While staying with them, she says they told her they didn't have any money and said that she needed to help them make money. There was conversation about um, me, um, things that I could do in order to provide um, some money. That I would have uh, sex with people for uh, money. If found guilty, Green is facing 5 to 99 years or life in prison. Testimony in this case continues tomorrow morning. And speaking of human trafficking, it's often called the hidden crime. Out of sight, unless you're educated to spot it. An annual report by the Human Trafficking Institute gives nationwide insight into the fluctuating numbers of victims and cases. Courtney Friedman breaks down that report and talks to a local organization about what perspective it brings to Texas and San Antonio. The Human Trafficking Institute's new annual report shows in 2021 there were 140 new criminal human trafficking cases filed in the federal court system, down 22% from the year before. There were 449 new victims in 2021, down 25% from the year before. Sometimes what that can mean is that a lot of these cases are being charged at your local level. And that's wonderful because that means the education that we're doing in our local law enforcement, our local communities is working. We're seeing an increase in those state cases. The Institute's senior legal counsel, Lindsay Lane, says in Texas, the problem is big, but so is the response. The report shows in 2021, Texas had the third highest number of sex trafficking cases and second highest in labor trafficking. We have some great task force work being done in Texas. Texas led the country this year in the number of defendants charged for trafficking. In in 2021, SAPD reported 23 trafficking cases, and there have been 13 so far in 2022. Here in the San Antonio area, there are so many victims and survivors that we already know about who are getting care, but there are many more that have not come forward yet. Technology is the gateway to access our children. Is there enough education? No. We want to be in front of every adult and youth in our city, and we hope someone is doing that in every city in America. April Molina is the communications director at Ransomed Life, helping survivors and training the entire community to spot and avoid trafficking. But to have this kind of hard data is very helpful. To law enforcement, lawmakers, nonprofits, and victims themselves. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. A shouting group of activists and renters from a northwest side apartment marching into City Hall today demanding support from Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Tenants at the Seven Oaks Apartments and members of the Texas Organizing Project have been pushing back against the new owner over recent evictions and problems at that property. Those problems include issues with the air conditioning, hot water, roaches and water damage. While code enforcement has already issued two dozen citations to the owner at Chief Properties, people there say that they want the mayor to throw his political weight behind them. I want him to come out and speak with the, with the people that own the apartments. Let them know that this is, this is not right. They need to get on their job. When you purchase something, you make it better for people to live there. You don't make it worse. Though the mayor says his staff will meet with people who live in Seven Oaks in the near future, an organizer with TOP said they expect nothing short of the mayor to meet with them. A building on the northeast side already a total loss after a weekend fire, but firefighters were out there again this morning when that fire rekindled. Crews returned to the 5500 block of Mountain Vista around 5.30 a.m. That's just inside Loop 1604 near Judson. We're told it's an old golf range. Fire officials say the roof collapsed after the fire on Sunday, and they think some embers under that fallen roof sparked back up. Firefighters did eventually snuff them out. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. We'll take you to the camera here at Loop 410 and Austin Highway. This is uh, the clearing stages of an accident there. You can see at least one lane blocked off. Looks like two lanes, the inside shoulder as well. 
uh, might be affecting traffic both sides of 410 at this point. But again, this is in the clearing stages. Hopefully all those lanes will be open at 410 and Austin Highway pretty soon. Yeah, it looks like the eastbound lanes of 410 as they head towards 35. It's already a busy area. Oh, yeah. Can only imagine with all this. And then you got the temperatures to deal with as well, Adam Kasky. It's not 107. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, we got we, that going for us. <laughs> we've been yeah. that warm this month and even a few times this summer. A lot of sunshine, blue sky overhead, 101. That was our high temperature today. Five degrees shy of the record, but well above the average of 96. And you look across the state, several triple digit readings Amarillo 100, Abilene 104, Dallas 103. But it's not as intense as it has been in recent days and weeks. I mean, Junction, a high of 95, Midland 98, the high temperature. Kutula, the hot spot today at 107. This evening, right now we're at 99 degrees by 8 o'clock, 95, 10 o'clock, 88. The wind's picking up out of the southeast. You'll notice that gusty wind off the Gulf of Mexico, which is really going to increase that humidity as well. But at least there will be a noticeable breeze up to 25 miles per hour at times. Also, a glimmer of hope for some rain. We'll talk about that in a bit. I just can't give up. First childhood cancer, then amputation, followed by years of pain. But there's a new prosthetic system that could be a game changer for amputees. That's coming up next here at 6. KSAT 12 celebrates Military City USA, powered by USAA. San Antonio is known as Military City USA, where every enlisted Air Force recruit starts their basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. What's it feel like to be it's eight weeks of training that transform a civilian into a United States Airman. And so this is where their, their Air Force career starts, and then it's also kind of the gateway into going further into their Air Force career. So they start here and they graduate here um, throughout basic training. They put blood, sweat, and tears onto all these drill pads, um, changed who they are as an individual to become a better individual here at Lackland Air Force Base. And on graduation day, just seeing how proud everyone in the stands is, how much taller they stand up on graduation day, how much taller you stand up as well. Just seeing that they they set their mind to something and they were able to accomplish it. And now they're going to go out and do amazing things for our Air Force. I'm Stefania Jimenez and tonight on the Night Beat, we're going to discuss protecting pets as these temperatures rise, the growing problem that Animal Services says that it's facing this summer, plus thousands of dollars in merchandise stolen in just a matter of minutes, the concerns that two San Antonio businesses are raising after recent break-ins. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. See you at 10. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, losing a limb is an unfortunate result of severe diabetes as well as trauma in war zones. There are as many as 2 million amputees in the United States, and many have difficulty either getting or wearing prosthetics. Ursula Perry now with a new procedure that's making a world of difference for those living with limb loss. 31-year-old Brock Potts feels at home working with his hands, but standing was painful until recently. Potts is a survivor of childhood cancer of the bone. During treatment as a teen, Potts suffered a life-threatening infection. Amputated me above the, above the knee because the infection it was growing so rapidly. For most of a decade, Potts' old prosthetics rubbed against his residual leg until it was raw. Every step I took, it was a stinging, burning, and there was nothing I could do about it. Dr. Joel Mayerson had a solution, a new prosthetic procedure. Osseointegration allows us to put a metal um, bar inside someone's bone. Surgeons then carefully close the area around the bar to prevent infection, leaving a small connection exposed. Instead of having a socket, like a shoe, we can have a prosthetic leg just snap on uh, the same way that you would snap a drill bit into a drill. There's nothing touching the outside of my leg like there was that socket giving me blisters. So this is a whole new feeling. Pot said he's used to beating the odds. After 30 rounds of chemo, doctors told him he'd be infertile. Now he's the head of a full household, aged nine months to nine years. I faced doctors saying I couldn't have kids. Now it's five, uh, five and then that, I, that's, that's quits for me. <laughs> Dr. Mayerson says that this surgery can be combined with another one, a nerve surgery that adds specialized electrical connections. It would allow prosthetic limbs to have a more intuitive movement. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
All right, so we did not break any records today. Is that where we are in celebrating the uh, high celebrating of the, the yeah. forecast? Yeah, you know, I'm at the point where we might as well just go ahead and break the record. Like we're so far into this thing right now, yeah. let's just do it. I don't know. You know we're, what? We're in two different camps. Uh, we are in. Depth. I know it's hard for you to believe, but yes. Yeah. Shocking. Just let's just break the thing. <laughs> I must brace her on this one. Yes. <laughs> just, this is also not, not shocking. shocking. <laughs> That's how things go yeah. around here. We're at 47 100 degree days. Once we hit 59, that'll be tied for the most in a year. And you know this triple digit heat's going to continue. But what Myra was talking about, no record highs today. It's still going to be warmer than average, but not record challenging in terms of the daily high temperatures for the next seven days and a few little showers are possible. And actually, let's take a look at the radar. You see not a lot of activity, but a few little showers did flare up. Parts of Lavaca County just north of Hallettsville and just outside of Moulton. Schulenburg, one little downpour that's now coming to an end. Unfortunately, that's it for the activity out there. But I do anticipate slightly better coverage, particularly between I-37 and I-10 over the next few days. Big picture is really quiet across most of Texas. Some showers in far west Texas. It's the time of year they typically get some rainfall with the monsoon season. And the upper level high, though, it's over east Texas, and you can really see the steering flow of the showers and active weather around the outer edges of that upper level high. But another thing we've noticed on the map is this upside down dip in the upper level flow. Okay, normally we would call that a bump in the upper level flow, but it's different because those bumps we talk about are the ridges. They're the high pressure systems. This is an inverted trough that's stirring things up around Florida. That's going to be traveling our way and it may help us a little bit in kickstarting a few showers and storms. Now I wish we would have the kind of radar coverage that Floridians are getting right now, but I don't think it's going to be that extensive. So let's talk about it tomorrow. We start the day with some low clouds and then a lot of sunshine by the midday and afternoon and just some patchy fair weather clouds. By the midday hours, most of the showers still offshore, but then closer to the Gulf coastline, uh, we're saying within about maybe 50 miles, a few developing pop up showers in the early afternoon. And then we move on in time, three, four o'clock. We could see some as close as Hallettsville to Quero, maybe even Goliad, Carn City. But most of the action is going to be east of San Antonio with the off chance of one or two stray brief downpour. So we're only looking at about a 10% chance here tomorrow afternoon, Thursday afternoon, and even on into Friday. Then another one of those inverted troughs on Monday. So a 10% chance. I mean, that's the best we can really drum up at this time. Let's talk temperatures. 100 Amarillo in Lubbock right now, 102 Del Rio, fairly similar readings across the state. It's nothing like what we had just several days ago where Wichita Falls was at 114. You know, I mean, we're not talking that intense heat that we have seen recently, but of course it's still hot out there. Catula now 104, Eagle Pass 102, 100 in Hondo, but 90s in the Hill Country, Fredericksburg at 96, even Bernie 95. 98 Seguin, Canyon Lake at 94 degrees and Divine 101. Let's talk about tomorrow morning. Mid 70s for most of us. 75 in Seguin, Port SA 75, lower 70s in the Hill Country. Then by the afternoon, we get well into the 90s and even right near 100 degrees for the high temperature. So tomorrow back to 100 and we're going to be right near 100 for highs the rest of this week through the weekend and even early next week. Significance of this is not talking record breaking high temperatures will be. We should be well below the record highs and I wouldn't be surprised if a few days were actually below 100 for the official high. We could actually get that here within the next few days. Dew points right now around 60 and in the lower 60s. And we're going to see the similar trend tomorrow. Very sticky in the morning and then those dew points drop off into the afternoon. So a heat index maybe up to 102. Right? We're not talking the extreme heat indices either. So at least temperatures have moderated a little bit, but still right around triple digits. 77 at 7 a.m. by the noon hour tomorrow. We're already at 93 degrees, some low clouds early, then a sunny afternoon. 100 the high temperature, a southeasterly breeze at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Spreister, I do think we'll tally up more 100 degree days, and it's only going to be 10 more when there's a lot of summer left, even August. So I do think that record is uh, very attainable. I'm not saying I'm enjoying this. No, I understand. What I'm saying is if we're going to get this close, we might as well just break it. Yeah, why settle for third place when you can have first? Yeah. You know, I would be okay with that. 
I'm not trying. <laughs> All right. Well, we're not trying. We're not trying. I'm just saying we might as well. All right, let's go to Cowboys camp right now. And is this a guy the Cowboys may have more trouble replacing than they think, Greg? Yeah, you're talking about Amari Cooper, and it couldn't happen at a worse time because he was a star wide receiver. And now we're getting more insight as to why the Cowboys decided to part ways with Cooper. When we come back, more about that from the Dallas Cowboys training camp here in California and how the Uvalde football team is going to use a jersey to pay tribute coming up. I need to win it. Uh, there's degrees. Uh, I want to be fair to everybody concerned. Uh, we need to uh, 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 be in the playoffs. We need to be viable in the playoffs to have a, be a successful season. Ray Jones set to turn 80 in October. Time is not on his side when it comes to winning another Super Bowl. It's time to go camping with KSAC. Camping with KSAC, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome live to Grand Park here in Ventura, California, just up the road from Oxnard, California, the site of the Dallas Cowboys training camp this year once again. Now, today was a state of the Cowboys address. Mike McCarthy, the head coach, of course, along with Stephen Jones walking in first with owner Jerry Jones in tow, the top Cowboys brass arriving full of optimism in Oxnard after a 12-5 and regular season last year and looking to build in the run in the playoffs. But it's been 26 years since the Cowboys have been in the NFC Championship game, and today, one question today, where's the secret? Secret sauce to get them back. The secret sauce. Uh, the genie, the genie, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's why we're here to be a trite. Uh, we're trying to find the secret sauce to get us another one. And uh, uh, it's uh, about as, uh, it's certainly the most challenging thing that I've ever been involved in. And I have have been involved in a lot of things, but uh, putting it together so that we can uh, uh, get a team to uh, win the uh, uh, Super Bowl is, uh, uh, has been real challenging, I admit it. And uh, it's given me that much more resolve to uh, get it done. We are getting more insight today on why the Cowboys decided to part ways with star wide receiver Amari Cooper. That's when Jones took a swipe at Coop. Saturday, the Cowboys decided not to guarantee his $20 million salary in 2022 as part of his five-year $100 million contract. You may remember that Coop missed three games this past season after he tested positive for COVID-19 after he declined to get vaccinated during the crisis. Jerry was very specific today that when you are that level of pay, it's about being available to play. When you have that kind of of uh, responsibility, which you do when uh, you have that much of the financial pie. So what I'm trying to say is those decisions were made more about availability than ability. And they were made as to how you arrived at not being unavailable at times. All right. First practice is tomorrow, and then right after that, we have the opening ceremonies on Saturday, and Jerry Jones joins us live on Instant Replay Sunday night at 11 o'clock. What a remarkable tribute that is being planned for the Valde football team has come up with a way in order to pay tribute to those who lost their lives in that mass shooting at Robb Elementary School. That's because the team will honor the 21 lives lost by wearing the jersey number 21 in every game starting this coming season. That's according to Dave Campbell's football magazine. Linebacker Justin Rendon will have the honor as a senior this year and then will pass it along to another senior next season who represents the program and the community. In other words, instead of retiring the jersey, they will use it to remember. And coming up tonight on the night beat, you'll see where we'll be coming live tonight, right there at the Tour Pier, only on the night beat. Live in Southern California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Greg, I'm very glad you've Alvi's doing that. I think it's a fitting tribute to those that were lost and just I, uh, remember their names. Great. Keeping great. it going every year, absolutely. Thank you, Greg. Still to come here at 6 o'clock, a lot of people on the clock to start making student loan payments after a pause of more than two years. When those payments are set to begin, if they're not paused again. And the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection in talks with the former high-ranking Trump administration official to testify who the committee wants to talk to next at 6.
The former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo reportedly in talks with the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. He could testify in a closed door session. That development comes as former President Donald Trump marks his first return to Washington, D.C. since leaving office. As ABC's Justin Finch reports, Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence arrived to D.C. today to speak at very different events. In their separate Washington Returns Tuesday, former President Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence outlined their visions for the Republican Party. There is no higher priority than cleaning up our streets, controlling our borders, stopping the drugs from pouring in, and quickly restoring law and order in America. The former vice president pushing back against claims he and Trump have had a political parting of ways. I don't know that the president and I differ on issues, but we may differ on focus. I truly do believe that elections are about the future. As Trump and Pence focus on the future, the January 6th probe presses on. ABC News has learned Mike Pompeo, Trump's former Secretary of State, is in talks to give closed-door testimony to the House Select Committee. Pompeo was a crucial figure in video testimony from former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson aired in a January 6th public hearing late last month. Hutchinson recalling an exchange she says she heard between Pompeo and former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows centering on cabinet members' conversations about possibly invoking the 25th Amendment to remove Trump from office on January 6th. You're technically the boss of all the cabinet secretaries and, you know, if, if conversations progress, you should be ready to take action on this. Word of possible new testimony from Pompeo comes after the committee has also heard from former Pence Chief of Staff Mark Short and former Pence Counsel Greg Jacob. Sources tell ABC Jacob and Short are cooperating with the Justice Department investigation as well. A lawyer for Pompeo declined to comment on Pompeo's testimony, as did a January 6th committee spokesperson, but the committee did close out its eighth hearing, promising more to follow, with more witnesses coming forward and more evidence uncovered. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. In other news around America, even more pessimism over the U.S. economy this past month. That's according to a conference board's latest survey on consumer attitudes, intentions, and expectations. It's the third straight month that index fell, a decline driven by consumers souring on the state of current business conditions. A spokeswoman said expectations of consumers for the next six months ahead held relatively steady, but remain at a level that suggests recession risks persist. And inflation continues to weigh heavily. For people who have student loans to pay off, the countdown is now on. Federal student loan payments are set to restart August 31st. The date has been extended several times. Whether it will be extended again, still undecided. A White House spokesperson says the Department of Education will, quote, continue to assess the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economy on student loan borrowers, end quote. But student loan servicers say that they have been told by the Department of Education to hold off on sending out billing statements. The U.S. now seeing its first cases of monkeypox in children. The CDC reporting two kids have been infected with the virus. Thousands of kids have been reported sick since the outbreak started in May. Mandy Gaither has the latest on what the U.S. is doing to step up its monkeypox response. Close to 3,000 monkeypox cases reported in the U.S. since May, but top U.S. health officials believe there are many more. It's a growing problem. The World Health Organization has declared it a public health emergency of international concern. The CDC says most of the cases are among men who have sex with men with a median age of 36. But the virus has now been identified in two children. The cases are unrelated and likely the result of household transmission. Both have symptoms but are in good health and receiving treatment. An investigation into how the children were infected is ongoing, but the virus is spread through close skin-to-skin -skin contact. The CDC says that can include holding, cuddling, feeding, or through shared items like towels, bedding, cups, and utensils. It's very clear with the spread of this that there now has to be a balance between vaccines available for those who clearly have been exposed 
as well as those at risk. Right now, states aren't required to report monkeypox data, meaning cases are likely undercounted. But the White House is now debating whether to declare a public health emergency to change that. 300,000 monkeypox vaccines have been shipped to U.S. states and territories. The CDC estimates that more than 1.5 million people are eligible for the vaccine. Each person needs two doses four weeks apart. I'm Mandy Gaither. And coming up, the work that a pair of UTSA professors are doing to preserve the musical heritage of the city's west side. It's next at six. Two UTSA professors hope to preserve the West Side's musical heritage through the West Side Sound Oral History Project. The professors are collecting interviews, photos, recordings of some of the music produced from the West Side of San Antonio. So far, they've interviewed more than 10 locals, including artists, about their memories and experiences with the genre of music that comes from San Antonio's West Side. The West Side Sound consists of many elements, including R&B, conjunto, and swamp pop. It was important to us to do this because we're losing a lot of these uh, people that actually created it. And who better to tell the stories than them? Something that we're learning uh, in the interviews is that folks do want to have sort of their legacy, their contributions documented, especially from our Mexican American community. I love this. And now I want to know what swamp pop is. Yeah, I'd like to know more too. In some areas of the country, it's something like soda. Don't think that's what it is on the West Side. The professors were awarded $5,000 through UTSA's West Side Community Partnership Initiative for this project to document the sounds, the music of the West Side. Let's take a look outside with live cam off in the distance there. And really any view we take around town, lots of brown grass. Out. Oh, it's yeah, that's what I don't like seeing and I mean even just trying to keep some of my plants alive is challenging this year and keeping them healthy and happy is not exactly easy. A lot of hand watering this year. Right now we're at 99 degrees, 8 o'clock, 95, 10 o'clock, 88, then at midnight about 83. Southeasterly breeze steady at 14 and we'll have some gusts up to 25 miles per hour. That's going to be nice at least over the next several hours into the nighttime as well. We're going to talk about our little chance, our slight chance of rain coming right up and we're not the only ones feeling some triple digit heat. We'll tell you more about that in a bit. In the buzz today, let's talk a whole lot of money. Mega Millions lottery officials, they're having a hard time giving away a whole lot of money. There was no winner Friday night, so they're adding even more money to tonight's jackpot. It is now about $810 million. That's a cash value of 470 million bucks. All right, they may have be, be having a hard time giving it away. They're not having a hard time selling tickets, though. There are now only three bigger jackpots that have ever been won in any lottery game. Two were Mega Millions, both over a billion dollars in 2018 and 2021. A $1.5 billion Powerball jackpot, the world record in January of 2016. The odds of winning tonight's jackpot are one in $303 million. And the state of Texas Lottery Commissioner just put out a statement saying that just today in the state of Texas, as of five o'clock, they've sold $17 million worth of tickets. And they broke that down, $28,000 per and minute? Per minute. Of ticket sales. Do you have one? I don't yet. I don't but, either, but I, I like waiting till it gets to this point. And we will have the winning numbers tonight on the night beat, just right. in case you wondered. Chipotle getting in on the crypto craze with a game called Buy the Dip. Guac and queso dip are involved here. It's extra, by the way. Yeah, yeah. All you have to do is go to the company's website where you plan to win free cryptocurrency or promo codes for guacamole or their tasty cheese dip. Yeah, the company says it will give away more than $200,000 in five types of digital currency. Just so happens Chipotle is also starting to accept 98 different cryptocurrencies at its restaurants. You only have until Sunday to play. Accepting 98 different kinds? Yeah. Do I get a discount on They're the They're dipping their foot in extra? cryptocurrency. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This has had me in tears. It is time to say goodbye to the Choco Taco. 
You ever had one of these? No. Oh my goodness. I used to ride my bike to buy these when I was a kid. Klondike says it is discontinuing the taco shaped ice cream bar. Choco tacos have been around since the 80s. They were pretty popular at one time, but Klondike says they are not as popular as their other products. Now I want one. They're delicious. After the way you sold it, riding your bike? Yes, my little brother and I, we'd hop on our bikes, we'd go down to the gas station, spring for one. Little Myra? Yeah. With her bike helmet on and, you know, the fringe hanging off the, the you handlebars. Bet I the, fringe. the fans are already taking to social media with comments like, Choco Taco has fallen and they always take the best things away from us, but there's still hope. Reddit co founder Alexis Ohanian tweeted an offer to Klondike's parent company to buy the rights to Choco Tacos. So maybe they'll be making a comeback. You know, I kind of have a little bit of a Caskey theory here. I hope it may be a little bit conspiracy where they're just yep. generating some PR for it to get folks like me back on our bikes to Didn't, get one. Was it to, to really ramp up the Choco talk Oh, oh hey. <laughs> wow. <laughs> was you it know, Twinkie who did that? Or? Sometimes you don't see it coming. Yeah, I know. A different That's pastry did that years ago, and I was somebody, it Twinkies or yeah, something somebody like bought that. The right. Yeah, be it's been done or before. Whatever. And nothing changed. Yeah, so good Twinkie. But you couldn't make a pun like Choco Talk. No, you oh. can't. <laughs> Unfortunately, we all endured it. 101. <laughs> that was our high temperature today. Five degrees shy of the record. Catula, the hot spot today, 107. Pleasanton, 102. Even New Braunfels, 101. But generally mid to upper 90s in the hill country. Now, we weren't the only ones feeling the heat today, the triple digit heat even. I mean, look across the nation and the northern tier, not so bad. But the upper level ridge, the high pokes northward up into the Pacific Northwest, and they're seeing a heat wave of their own right around 100 degrees. Parts of uh, we're talking Washington, Oregon and Idaho, well above average, some record challenging high temperatures. So actually similar readings in what has been a cool summer for the Pacific Northwest. But now they're getting a little bit of taste of, of what we have down here. Ninety nine currently. Dew point is 62, so it feels like it's one degree warmer than the air temperature. That's going to be the case, I think, tomorrow as well. Dew points making it feel like it's one to two degrees warmer than the real reading out there. So not a big issue in terms of the heat index. We're starting to dip back down in the 90s. 93 Victoria, 96 Kennedy, 99 Gonzalez, but still some triple digits along Highway 90 west of town. Castroville, Hondo, Uvalde, all at 100, but well, Verde 96 and Converse now at 99 degrees measured at Randolph Air Force Base. Now, here's the nice thing. That breeze is kicking up again, as it often does in the evening this time of year. And we've got the wind gusting up to 28 miles per hour officially at the airport. And this wind is going to remain gusty really for the rest of this evening and through about 1 to 2 a.m. tonight. So that wind from the Gulf of Mexico at times gusting over 20 miles per hour into the nighttime hours. That's going to quickly increase the humidity outside and that dew point is going to spike again after sunset. You look at the satellite and radar, good activity over drought stricken New Mexico and even Arizona, parts of West Texas. It is monsoon season there and upper level highs over East Texas. But what we are watching is this upside down trough this inverted trough here near Florida, helping to generate some nice shower activity for a good portion of the Florida Peninsula. That's going to push our way and help us out a little bit the next few days, but not really giving us any promising rain chances. We're talking 10% chance Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, and then again on into Monday. That's the best we can do. So if you isolated downpours here and there, I want to show you really quickly the African dust, the Saharan air layer. It's not going to hit us this week. It's going to be thick out over the ocean. However, once we get into Saturday, you'll notice that extra haze in the air, light to moderate amounts of that Saharan dust in place. So here's your case at 12 hour forecast 77 in the morning. By the afternoon, we're up to 100 degrees mixture of sun and clouds. Yeah, we're feeling the heat in triple digits, but it's not as excessive as what we have had recently, especially in weeks past, but hovering right around 100 next seven days. Not as bad. <laughs> it's not 107, it's yes. not 104. Yes, yes, yes. We've been there lately. In case you missed it, coming up next. It's Tuesday, <laughs> it is July 26th. 
another meeting in Uvalde, but this time tonight, it's the Uvalde City Council convening. Yeah, the big item is this resolution calling for Greg Abbott to raise the age limit to purchase an assault style rifle. Now, if the city council were to pass this resolution tonight, they'll join the county commissioners and the school board in this movement. Ever since the shooting at Romb Elementary, we've seen the Uvalde community mobilized to make substantial change. Earlier this month, families of victims were in D.C. yet again, calling on lawmakers to make changes. We're still working to learn the name of a 31 year old man killed in a crash this morning. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says the victim, a passenger in an SUV that crashed into a big rig on Calabra near Tally Road. That man died at the scene. The 17 year old driver taken to University Hospital. Blood banks once again putting a call out to donors. They're hoping more people will roll up their sleeves and donate. Right now, the need is so bad, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says some surgeries are having to be postponed. The center says it has a three-day supply of blood on hand, but less than a day's worth of type O blood. Type O blood can be used for trauma and cancer patients as well as surgeries. Tonight's Mega Millions lottery drawing now sitting at about $810 million. That's a cash value of $470 million. There are now only three bigger jackpots that have ever been won in any lottery game. Two of them were for more than a billion dollars. The Mega Millions jackpots, the odds of winning tonight's jackpot, just one in 303 million.